Thank you, Lisa. It's a real pleasure to be back here with all of you. Uh, I am going to talk about what's in the title of this talk, but I'm also going to inject some of my opinions about the future of AI today and weave that in. So I haven't done that too, uh, publicly before, so you are the first, and I'll welcome your feedback afterwards. This is Henry Lapham. When Henry was three, he had a couple of seizures that were associated with fevers. And febrile seizures are, uh, parents are told by the doctors that that's not a big deal. They're pretty common. Children outgrow them. Uh, don't worry about it. Henry's family uh, took care of Henry. And then when he was four, he had a convulsive seizure that was not associated with a fever. And his mom took him back to the doctor. And Later, while the diagnosis of epilepsy was still in the mail, uh, one morning, Henry's mom went to uh, wake him up and get him out of bed. And she found his, his cold, lifeless body uh, in his bed. Henry died of what's called SUDEP, sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. I'm curious how many of you have heard of it. I know many of you have heard me talk about it before, but still very few in this audience. SUDEP is what happens when somebody with an epilepsy diagnosis is found dead, but they cannot attribute the death to any other cause, not to drowning, not to hitting their head, no accidents. Uh, an autopsy shows that there was no other cause of death. There's a SUDEP every seven to nine minutes. In the United States, where we're so advanced, uh, there are still more suit-ups every year than house fires taking people's lives. And of course, many more people live in houses than get an epilepsy diagnosis. And these are the absolute total numbers. It's also believed with the latest science, looking at the brains of children who die of SIDS, that this may be a similar mechanism to what is behind SIDS, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. And how many of you have heard of SIDS? Everybody, right? Uh, so what is this? Well, there's been a lot of advances in the science recently. For those of you who don't know, a seizure is unusual electrical activity in the brain. When normal electrical activity becomes more like a little local brush fire, uh, it can cause unusual sensations. Somebody could have one in this room right now without the person next to them knowing. Um, or it can spread all over the brain, generalize, cause convulsions, cause you to lose consciousness, and then it's very obvious when, uh, when the seizure is happening. One in 26 people in America will have epilepsy at some point in their life. That's seizures that recur, uh, you know, more than one, that are not explained by something like a fever. It's also the case, while I gave you the example of Henry, and there are many examples online foundations started by people who've lost their little teeny ones, uh, that the, the deaths due to the children are actually much uh, less likely here, proportion of the total cases of SUDEP, um, than people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. Pretty much the age in this room is when these events peak. Now, there are two things that can make the risk of SUDEP go down. One is being compliant to medications, and a lot of medications have pretty crappy side effects. So if people aren't told about the risk of SUDEP, they may skip some of their meds. Uh, and the other that has been demonstrated in the literature multiple times now is that SUDEP is much less likely if you're not alone when you have the seizure. If somebody is there, then the rates of SUDEP are much lower. It's most associated with the seizures when people are alone. Uh, for those who haven't heard of it, going, what is she making this up? Like, how could this be such a big thing? Here's some of the numbers from a paper published by Thurman and, and um, a super respected group of colleagues. Um, years of potential life lost uh, is the vertical axis. So that's deaths times remaining lifespan. Stroke is number one of all neurological diseases. SUDEP is number two. And furthermore, studies of coroner reports show that these are probably only reporting about 30% of the actual cases that qualify as SUDEP. Um, Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, uh, Parkinson's, and Lou Gehrig's disease 
are lower on years of potential life loss. Now, furthermore, since usually these happen only when people are alone, and I can give you a lot more science on why we think this might be, uh, we think you could help prevent these deaths. And I mean this literally, the people in this room. Uh, you could. Now, I know some of you are doctors, but many of you, are, like me, probably have never even had Medicine 101, so you may be going, how could you do this? Well, it turns out uh, we've been making some findings that completely surprised me that have led to this understanding and, and pieces of this puzzle for how people can help. Uh, our work started trying to help people with autism who could not communicate their stress. And here's a, a boy who looks kind of stressed on the outside, but we've worked with lots of people who outwardly may have looked very calm, um, but inwardly their autonomic nervous system uh, was not at all calm. We built sensors here in the media lab years ago. There's some shown on the ankles of the occupational therapist and the child here, uh, which could measure the skin conductance response. This is a signal that changes with pseudomotor innervation, uh, the sweat glands being activated, it starts deep in the brain and is manifest with changes in electrical conductance on the surface of the skin. When you get sweaty, it goes up, but also it can go up very sensitively, even when you're just experiencing cognitive load or excitement and many other emotional changes that we have been measuring in our lab and focusing on. Uh, and one day, one of our sensors here, a uh, domo sweatband, that had embedded in it the ability to log this data 24-7, was being warned by a young boy with autism when he had a convulsive seizure. And in that case, and in subsequent trials with, uh, that we did in a study with Children's Hospital Boston with more than 90 people, we found that each of the convulsive seizures was accompanied by a large rise in skin conductance. Uh, here, the peak on the left was a generalized tonic-clonic seizure from a young man over at Children's Hospital Boston. The other little peaks on the right are usually the peaks that are the biggest during the day, and those occur during non-REM sleep. So we set about making lots more devices and um, getting them tested, doing lots of epilepsy testing, and learning that, in fact, we could more accurately detect uh, generalized tonic-clonic seizures using this combination of skin conductance and movement than had been done uh, previously before. Uh, here's just an example of skin conductance on the wrist for three seizures labeled by experts. This is 24 hours of data. The little peaks in the middle here are uh, sleep. Um, here's the accelerometer data, and you can see that if you just use accelerometer data, you run the risk of a lot of false alarms. But when you couple the two signals, it can improve the accuracy. Uh, since I last spoke to you, there has been another very large study completed showing this, and also um, Empatica has not only commercialized this, but they just recently got FDA approval, clearance, for monitoring seizures in adults using Embrace, the watch shown here. So now there is an approved medical device for uh, monitoring these most dangerous kinds of seizures, which it is now known that the mechanisms that can cause these, the unusual brain activity, can not only make you unconscious, but in the moments when it looks like the seizure has ended, and minutes later, when it looks like the person is just calm and relaxing, that's, that may be the most dangerous period, when deep inside the brain, even though there's no movement outwardly, the seizure may be spreading to the amygdala and regions that can turn off your breathing. And that loss of respiration could be restored, in fact, if somebody comes there stimulates you and uh, says your name, flips you over, and restarts your breathing. We've now seen this in action. We've gotten emails from people that <laughs> increase my skin conductance, such as this one from a mom who was in the shower one morning. She saw her phone go off on the counter, saying her daughter's uh, embrace had detected a possible uh, generalized tonic-clonic seizure, might need her help. She goes running out of the shower to check on her daughter, finds her face down in bed, blue, and not breathing, flips her over, and her daughter takes a breath and another breath uh, and turns pink again and was fine. We're now hearing lots of stories like this. When people get there in the moments afterwards, they can stimulate the person or provide other kinds of first aid and uh, restart their breathing. 
I've given examples with children, but again, the most uh, suit-ups are happening um, in the news stories we see of people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. So I just want to take a moment and say, everybody in this room, uh, if you don't think you know anybody with epilepsy, ask your friends and your neighbors. It is unfortunately so stigmatized that they probably haven't told you. And you may, be, you may be next door in the dorm room, next door in the apartment, next door in your neighborhood to somebody who this could happen to. So please, we need people to, um, to talk about this, destigmatize it, and let people know that this can happen and that it could, in many cases, be prevented. Today, there's no full tech AI solution. Even all the brain implant technology that's trying to squelch seizures doesn't succeed most of the time for these events. Uh, it may in the future, but now we need human help. Um, a device like this running machine learning AI full time can summon somebody there, but if nobody comes, if nobody finds out that they need to come, if nobody signs up as a caregiver, then uh, it won't work. Lest you think this is just me saying, oh, suit up, you know, we've been learning all about this, um, you know, why don't doctors tell their patients about it? It's a really good question. <laughs> doctors have been told to tell their patients about it. The official recommendation of the American Academy of Neurology has recently said, you need to tell people about this. Um, a lot of doctors still are reluctant to tell people about it. Maybe they're not signing the soccer forms for their kids um, that show that you know, everybody's saying there's a risk of death to everything these days. So they're scared to tell their patients. Um, but patients want to be told, and other studies have shown this. Um, SUDEP is the number one cause of death in epilepsy, and families want to know. So not only the doctors should be telling them, but all of us should be lifting the stigma from this disease so that people can talk about this and prevent these deaths. So there's no tech AI full solution, even with all the advanced wearables and cool stuff you'll see today. Uh, so I just want to remind us that our help is needed as human beings with this technology. Now I want to dip into a little bit of the science because this leads to the other story I want to share with you that I think is um, also very cool and some of our latest work here. When we found these big peaks, I was scratching my head because you know, the seizure itself is only a couple minutes. It's about the width of that red line. And from 17 to 18 there is a whole hour. So why is this skin conductance going up so long uh, and so high when, in fact, the convulsive activity is very brief, nobody's cranked up the heat or humidity in the room, the person just looks like they're kind of taking it easy, uh, there's nobody there stressing them out like we've done at MIT in our stress experiments. Um, so why are these so big? And as we tried to answer this question, we learned about a number of things that were really surprising. Uh, one of them was that when the seizure happens, these, these are EEG channels across the scalp, and this is time. And so here, each electrode is showing seizure activity, really unusual brain activity. Uh, instead of normal brain activity here, it just looks flat. It looks like they've gone brain dead. It looks like the seizure was so overactivated that something in the brain tried to squelch it and overreacted and turned off the brain. That's what we thought originally. But the bizarre thing is here, the longer this post-dictal, post uh, the seizure, generalized across all EEG channels, um, suppression, less than 10 microvolts happens, the longer this happens, the bigger the response we get of skin conductance on the wrist. Why on earth would the amount of sweating on the wrist be more related to uh, how long the brain looks like it's shutting down, right? What's going on here? Uh, and furthermore, this was um, validated not just uh, once, but many times here in the first pediatric cohort and then later replicated with a group of adults. Uh, and this is published in Neurology, top medical journal. So what we're finding is the longer the brain waves are suppressed, the bigger the skin conductance response. And that's whether you measure it with area under the curve or, or intensity. Long story short, we've been learning that there are mappings from the moment we were knit together in the womb that knit together our brain, our spinal cord, all of our neural system with this largest organ, the skin. 
And some of us learned, you know, early on, little mappings between the brain and touch, right? Different regions. But this is different. This is mappings between regions deep in the brain involved in emotion, memory, attention, and now seizures, since those can hit anywhere in the brain, uh, that are showing up in different patterns on the skin. This is uh, not our lab's work. This is the work of Mangina and Bujra and Mangina, who went in the brains of people with epilepsy and directly stimulated these key brain regions involved in emotion, memory, and attention. In particular, um, fear, anxiety, and stress, amygdala uh, here, the left amygdala and right amygdala. And when they stimulated the left amygdala, there was a large skin conductance response on, in this case, the left palm, and a very small one on the right palm. And when they stimulated the right amygdala, there was a large skin conductance on the right palm and very little on the left palm. And similarly, for the right anterior hippocampus, posterior hippocampus, cingulate, um, but not true for the cortex and mid-T2. So EEG-based studies that have been reading the cortex have not found this laterality, or if they do, it's kind of in the noise. But when you can go in invasively deep in the brain, you can find these mappings are much more specific so when we originally thought skin conductance was just general arousal, it was general stress, uh, and we're very surprised later to start finding that it wasn't so general. We have been finding that very specific peaks and different locations may arise with different kinds of brain activity. Uh, so now our challenge is a really big one, and that is to try to map these regions, to map the regions deep in the brain, which requires invasive uh, surgery right now, um, to those um, external on the skin. In so doing, we can bring together more of the understanding that usually requires uh, invasive measures or fMRI um, with that which is uh, able to be picked up non-invasively by future and present wearables. Now with that new insight that these regions of the brain involved in um, stress and emotion in particular map onto regions of the body, I decided to revisit something that my boss many years ago had asked me to do here at the Media Lab. Um, back before we were actually helping people with epilepsy and I was just building smarter AIs, uh, he said to me once, he said, Roz, when are you going to do something really useful? <laughs> I'm like, all right, what do you want me to do? You don't think emotionally intelligent machines are useful enough. Um, he said, I want you to build the mood ring that tells me my wife's mood before I go home. And I was like, okay, all right, are you sure? Because, you know, if she knows that you know her mood, then she might expect. Um, well, at the time I dismissed it because a mood ring, as you may know, was the stupid little um, temperature sensor that just turned colors, right? And at MIT, we want to work on problems that are really hard and really important. Now, lately, the problem of mood has become increasingly recognized not just as really hard, but as also incredibly important. Um, apologies right now, this is my most depressing slide, but I think these are numbers we all need to come to grips with. What we're finding, and this is not just a blip of the last year's data in the news, uh, it's more than 15 years of data from the CDC, recently updated with an even higher rate, uh, that the rates of suicide are increasing significantly in the United States, um, actually more than 24% over the last uh, decades. And this is not just here in the United States, this is global. In fact, the World Health Organization has done a very meaty report country by country showing that suicide and depression are on track to be the number one cause of death and years lived with disability by the year 2030. Number one, that's more than cancer, that's more than Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, um, that's more than accidents and war and stroke. Now, I don't know about you, but I really, I'm really bothered by this. Um, it is a forecast, so I'm asking, why does it have to be this way? Could we not do something about this? And as we've been in my role with Mind, Hand, Heart here at MIT, wrestling with how to do a better job to promote mental health on campus, I've been meeting with lots of CEOs who are also saying this is a huge problem in their companies. Uh, we have been learning that, you know, not just MIT, but your company hires somebody, they're doing awesome. Uh, by the way, this is my only non-real data. This is a concept diagram here. 
because there are hundreds of things we measure that get rolled up here, say that they're doing really well. This is time. They come in. Uh, hopefully, it's a great match. They do even better. Um, but unfortunately, over time, we see way too many people taking this path. And the funny thing is, back here, they just look fine. You can't outwardly see any difference in them. And it's such a stigmatized condition that we don't talk about it. So people often hide the problems that they're suffering through. Could we, with technology, see that they have moved from the blue line to the red line, that they are not, in fact, as resilient as they look? Technology, our wearables, are very good at measuring these subtle changes. Let me give the um, old metaphor of the frog in the pot. Right? You put the frog in the pot on the stove, you turn on the heat, the frog's swimming around, oblivious to the fact that it's getting warmer and warmer and warmer. But a temperature sensor is really good at saying when it's time to get the frog out of there before he boils. Right? And our wearables and our smartphones, it turns out, are like that temperature sensor, only vastly more sophisticated when we couple them with machine learning. Here's an example of work from my group working with Mass General Hospital psychiatrists where the psychiatrist gave the Hamilton depression rating scale scores shown here across the bottom. Higher is worse depression. Uh, this was in a group of 22 patients diagnosed with major depressive disorder, monitored over eight weeks. The doctors are measuring them for the ground truth labels every two weeks. Meanwhile, we're hiding some of that data, building machine learning algorithms, and testing if using only smartphone sensors and wearable sensors here, the Empatica E4 was used, could we predict the HDRS value uh, and how accurately. And the accuracy is already 0.834 correlated with the top psychiatrists. I was um, invited to speak at the American Psychiatric Association about this and a bunch of our work in this area, and they said, wow, this is the same accuracy we have with each other. So the technology could help augment the doctor. It is not doing diagnosis here, I just want to be clear. It's taking people who are already diagnosed and tracking their changes. We're also working on stress because stress is not just where I started, and we have a lot of it here um, in Boston and uh, MIT, but also um, we think and we find repeatedly that it's very associated with mental health changes. If we want to detect what's changing before the frog is starting to boil, um, Huge changes in stress that are chronic are one of those factors. So we want to see not only can we detect your stress now, which we've been working on for years and making progress on, but could we actually forecast tomorrow's stress? Could we see if you're getting uh, better or if you're getting worse? Because that is when you could do something about it with a little bit more motivation to act. And here the work of um, Turumi Umimatsu, joint with NEC Corporation, Akane Sano and Sarah Taylor, is now showing that we are 84, about 84% accurate um, predicting tomorrow night's stress. Uh, this is limited to college students right now. We'd love to work with other populations as well, trying to start some studies there. Um, and this is right now based on five days data. Uh, and that's using all the features from surveys, physiology, phone, and mobility. It drops to, or is still more than 83% if we limit it to just a wearable sensor which is still pretty good, um, maybe better, certainly better than weather forecasting was when it got started. So our goal is to help you predict your um, mental health uh, parameters that are objective um, and how they might change and be associated with things that would affect your mood, your stress, and also your physical health. That's important. We threw in physical health originally just because it's highly correlated with these other things, um, but now we're realizing we're actually pretty good at predicting if you're going to get sick tomorrow, too, which was not something we went after originally, but is coupled in to these behaviors that are affecting our neurology. How accurate is this when we set up the problem just to forecast tomorrow night's uh, high stress, low stress, positive mood, negative mood, or healthy, sick state? A little bit oversimplified here, top 40% of the rating, bottom 40% of the rating. Uh, we are already 78 to 87% accurate forecasting those three things for tomorrow night in college students. Now, if you think about this, you've got the app of the future, right? <laughs> Actually, it's here today, uh, that could say, OK, Roz, um, tomorrow night, 40% chance of higher stress, 30% chance of worse mood, 25% chance of getting sick. I don't know about you, but I think I would delete that app. I'm not really sure I want that. Uh-oh, what have we built? 
Um, that's pretty depressing, right? Um, I would look like this. However, with all the data we're collecting, what if we can also, in an evidence-based way, show you, and we, we can't prove causality here yet, um, but we are finding what's associated with, based on your past behavior and people like you, your likelihood of going from a day like you're having now to a better day tomorrow. Maybe it makes a recommendation this morning for things I can do today. Maybe I can, instead of agreeing to do this extra work tonight, I can plan to go to bed a couple hours earlier. Maybe I can look at my afternoon schedule and convert that sit-down meeting to a walking meeting. Maybe I can uh, change something else so that I can call a friend. It learns what makes a difference for you. And we are now starting to work on that. Uh, here is just some examples of doing this and recognizing also that here using a um, clustering of Dirichlet priors, we're seeing four clusters pop out here. This is the problem of forecasting tomorrow night's happy, sad state. And we're seeing for this cluster of people, there's bright yellow, which means a really high feature weight on in-person interaction at night, positive social interaction before sleep uh, for this group. And that the reverse of that, actually, not, no social interaction, is better for another group uh, the next night. Now, it may be that they just didn't have any. Uh, but this is something where we see there are individual differences that are very important to take into account here. Uh, it's not enough to look for just a one-size-fits-all solution. That said, we are still looking. When you don't know somebody yet, when you haven't clustered them in, we're trying to learn what are the things that show up over and over as mattering in our data. And we are finding some things showing up repeatedly. Uh, on the far right here uh, are the coefficients in a, a different method, a lasso regression, that are the most associated with stress. And on the far left, the ones most associated with calm. And here I've emphasized the ones that are showing up repeatedly, and you even saw them in the previous diagram, although they can depend on an individual situation, uh, that positive social interaction is repeatedly associated with calm and negative social interaction repeatedly associated with increasing stress. Uh, the only one to the right of that is one we've also been doing a lot of work on, and that is sleep irregularity. Um, in our college students, the regularity of your sleep from day to day is showing up repeatedly as more associated with problems with mental health and higher stress than is the duration of your sleep. But I want to just emphasize this issue of um, interaction. This is not something technology can solve for us right now. And as we work about work to invent the future of AI and we focus on super cool things we're building that go in our bodies and on our bodies and bring the most advanced machine learning to help us interpret that data, I want us to keep in mind two things here that we are finding from this objective data. We are finding that it really matters that people are there. It really matters that you reach out to your neighbor and find out if they might need help at a particular moment. Um, we are finding it really matters if you have positive or negative social interaction with each other. It's not enough to optimize your meditation, your sleep, your diet, and all this stuff. The social factor is huge. So I think we've got to stop just focusing, focusing on maximizing the AI, although we do need to keep making all the cool improvements there. But we need to think about jointly optimizing uh, us in that picture. What is our role as part of crafting together that much healthier future for everybody. Quick recap, I talked about Henry. There's a suit up every seven to nine minutes. Uh, it is now known that these are significantly less likely to happen if somebody can get there, if somebody's there in the moments afterwards, minutes afterwards, when the breathing may turn off. Uh, we've accidentally discovered that a wrist wearable can pick up these most dangerous kinds of seizures, that the size of that activity is related to suppression of the cortex, the duration of that. Uh, that is also, uh, I left out a very important point, that has also been separately observed in 100% of SUDEPs. Uh, there are now FDA-approved devices for this, um, one made by Empatica, and Chelsea sitting right here I see from Empatica has brought examples of technology there, including one that's used in a lot of research. I think people want to play with this and learn more about this. 
Uh, we continue to use wearables and now combined with invasive measuring in the brain to understand the mappings between these core regions of emotion, memory, and attention, and how they relate to things that we can measure on the surface of the skin. Uh, we combine that with advanced machine learning and AI to not just recognize what's going on now, but to try to forecast, sometimes in very personalized ways, what might happen to you tomorrow. Um, and what are we finding in all of this AI? We are finding not just how to forecast it, but as we work to figure out how to change that weather forecast, how to have a better outcome, we are coming right back to finding that our human interactions are mattering more than ever uh, for predicting if tomorrow night you're gonna have lower stress, a better mood, and better physical health. So in this amazing audience here today where there's so much brain power on the science and the technology and the AI, um, I hope we'll all just remember today that we're all still just people too. And let's bring our humanity together with that technology as we work together to build, hopefully, a much better future for everybody. Thank you. Ah, and you can find publications um, of everything I've talked about here. And uh, I may have one minute for questions. Yeah, two minutes. And there's microphones there. Thank you, Roz, for fantastic talk and uh, bringing attention to the importance of SUDEP. I'm very curious if you've been able to detect the precursors of epileptic events. So you have seizure dogs that can tell mm -hmm. a, a child that they're going to have a seizure within three or four days. Um, and I'm curious how these devices can help detect those types of events. Thanks. Yes, we're very excited about the opportunity now. We are not only detecting events with our devices at Empatica, but we are um, FDA cleared also for the data that's continuously collected. And with that data now being continuously collected by huge numbers of patients, we have the opportunity to start to forecast. So we are working on that. Um, right now, however, compared to seizure dogs, if anybody knows of any studies that have actually shown that that works, I have been digging into that and it's still kind of mostly hearsay. As I go from the very cool stories to dig in to try to find the dog to actually run the studies with, I haven't actually um, turned up with really strong uh, evidence yet. So I'm not saying it's not there. I'm just saying I haven't gotten it yet. OK. If you could connect. Yeah, if you could connect me, I'll, I'll keep trying. Because what we think is that it's probably the olfactory system, which is probably triggered by several of the things that we may have an opportunity to pick up. Yeah. Um, so we're on the same page. We've, we've been super interested in that. Yep. One last, one more question. And then I'm going to be around most of the day in all the breaks. Mm -hmm. yep. Hi, this is Sayed Ali, Deep Learning AI. Um, from what you said, I think you really need to get together with the, the architects to take care of the number one factor in depression, to build better buildings and workspaces to have more social interactions. There's some here in the room. <laughs> we are in the School of Architecture and Urban, Urban Studies, and we are working together. Thank you. You're quite right. We are all part of crafting this future solution. Every Everybody needs to be involved in preventing that forecast for 2030. All right, thank you.